Well, thank you all for being here. It's with great pleasure that the Democratic Volunteer Center welcomes Professor Larry Diamond, Senior Fellow at the Freeman Spogley Institute for International Studies, Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institute. Uh, he teaches at Stanford University. He is the author of seven books on democracy, editor of dozens of books on democracy. Everything I've ever seen from Larry Diamond is about democracy. Uh, I haven't checked, but he probably has a dog named Democracy. He has dedicated his life to understanding, studying, and providing advice on how to maintain democracy. Hello and welcome partners and friends. Thank you for joining the DDC today for this excellent program featuring leading scholar on democracy studies, Larry Diamond. But first, let me say, congratulations on the successful outcome on the recall election. No matter how we feel about the recall process, we must take a moment to recognize all of our efforts were successful. We all worked really hard to get out the Democratic vote, and we are going to have to work even harder in 2022. We perform best when we work together. Bringing volunteers together and providing a platform for engagement in the democratic process is what the DVC provides. As you can see, we've been doing since our founding in 2010. We will continue to build upon the skills we adapted to during our pandemic separation, but we do hope to have a physical space in 2022. There is nothing like coming together in a community space to create energy and enthusiasm. We need to support each other as we protect our democracy, which is being seriously challenged. And Larry will share a lot of that with us coming up. The DVC needs your financial support for our 2022 campaign. If you're able to donate, we, we sincerely appreciate your support and look forward to working together to secure democratic victories in 2022. I would like to, to thank the DVC Events Committee who put this outstanding event together today. And of course, all of our committees and volunteers who work tirelessly to organize engagement opportunities. Special shout out to Emmy Thurber who reached out to Rokana, Diana Rolf who invited Larry Diamond to be our esteemed guest speaker. And of course, our very supportive local representatives. Now, let me introduce Representative Ro Khanna, who, as Lawrence said, couldn't be here with us today, but sent a wonderful video to introduce his friend and our guest speaker, Larry Diamond. Hi, everyone. Ro Khanna here. I'm so appreciative of Emmy Thurber's leadership in pulling together this important talk by Professor Larry Diamond. A thank you to the Democratic Volunteer Center and all of you who are volunteering so hard a big defeat of the recall efforts. Thank you for your efforts there. I'm so honored to introduce Larry Diamond. Larry is brilliant, a uh, leading political theorist uh, in our country. He has been a champion uh, on issues of democracy reform, of issues of making sure that uh, our elections are fair and preventing misinformation and disinformation campaigns. Larry has been a champion of deliberative democracy, of making sure people participate in democracy uh, and are informed. Uh, but most important, Larry uh, understands the right to vote is sacred, that we need to be able to protect it across this country. He understands the need for campaign finance reform. He understands the need for finding forums to have the type of town halls uh, and conversations that built American democracy. There are a few people I admire or respect more, a uh, true public intellectual, an activist, someone whose work I read often uh, and who as uh, counsel I see. Thank you, Larry, for doing this. Uh, we are excited to, to hear from you. Well, <laughs> what an honor to be introduced by Ro Khanna. I thought he was just going to give uh, an inspirational message to us, uh, and instead he gave an inspirational message to me. So uh, that's uh, probably the best introduction I've ever been given, and I've been doing this for some 40 years now. It's, it's such an honor uh, 
to be with uh, Democrats of Silicon Valley and the Democratic Volunteer Center. Uh, I thank the DVC for what it's doing to promote active engagement in our democracy. I think this is extremely important to have and to stimulate from people of diverse parties and political views who share a commitment to democracy. And I do emphasize that, and I'll keep coming back to that. And, um, you know, I have enormous admiration for Ro Khanna. Uh, I actually just uh, <laughs> saw him and heard him speak yesterday uh, at an event for him in the area. I think that um, he's one of the, uh, great representatives, one of the most creative uh, thinkers in the U.S. House of Representatives. And uh, I'm not sure if people in the Bay Area are even fully aware of how fortunate they are to have, I mean, look, we have individual representatives in individual districts, but uh, to some extent, I think the Bay Area is a larger community that feels some uh, sense of identification with its various representatives. And Anyway, we are, uh, we are blessed to have Ro Khanna uh, as uh, a leader uh, in Congress and in our California congressional delegation. Uh, I think we're in big trouble in American democracy. I don't think it's even come close to ending or even really easing uh, after January 6th uh, of this year. Uh, the fact that the protest burned out uh, and was fairly inconsequential yesterday, the, you know, uh, Trump mania protest that uh, didn't really go anywhere, should not be greeted with uh, excessive sighs of relief. There is, uh, there remains with us um, a tremendous uh, and alarming defection from democratic norms by a wide swath uh, of the Republican Party, um, by uh, probably a majority of the people who are activists today in the Republican Party and who helped it determine who gets nominated uh, in Republican primaries, which is why Stanford alum and member of the House of Representatives with a, a very proudly conservative voting record from Ohio, Anthony Gonzalez this weekend announced his retirement uh, from the U.S. House of Representatives after just two terms. This is um, an indication of, of what we're dealing with. Just look at all the distinguished, uh, impressive, um, responsible, uh, and I'd say for the most part, quite respectably conservative, uh, Republican members of the House and Senate who've retired uh, since uh, uh, Trump got elected, Flake uh, in Arizona, uh, Corker in Tennessee, uh, Gonzalez now in Ohio, Senator Rob Portman. These are people who are not liberals. You know, they've got quite respectable conservative voting records. Uh, but they believe in democracy and uh, they can't stomach any longer going along with this um, militant Trump uh, agenda for not only uh, pushing the narrow xenophobic Make America Great line, but also for distorting, twisting, uh, trashing and endangering our democratic institutions and norms. So the rest of what I have to say uh, in this presentation and in answer to your questions is to think about how to bring us back from the precipice of increasing polarization, the increasing gap uh, in views and sentiments between Republicans and Democrats and increasing extremism and defection from commitment to democracy. Uh, I have an agenda for uh, democratic repair and reform. This is my own list. We all have our, our list. Uh, it begins with the urgent and expands out to uh, a long-term view of what we need to do to 
reform, renew, reinvigorate, and secure American democracy. Uh, we have to defend uh, at the beginning free and fair elections in the United States, which are under relentless attack and are at risk of being made unfree and unfair in 2022 and particularly 2024. I'll speak more about this. I think you know what I'm talking about. We have a, I think, face a very serious risk of the breakdown of American democracy in 2024 as the result of what would be Trump Republican efforts to undermine the neutral and fair administration of elections uh, and to uh, steal uh, state electoral college delegations. Secondly, and with equal urgency, we need both to stop voter suppression and expanding voting, voting rights. And of course, we have obvious legislative instruments to do so that we need to find a way to pass. Uh, overall, I think we have to strengthen election security and administration in the US. There's a lot more to be said than what I have the time to say here now. Then we get to uh, a structure, a, a cluster of reforms that are more medium uh, term, if not longer term, uh, having to do with reforming our electoral systems. The most important one, I think the game, cha the game changer is ranked choice voting. I can explain why I think so. Uh, a number of you uh, will understand that since you live uh, in the Bay Area, and we have RCV in a number of Bay Area cities, including San Francisco and Oakland. Related to this, and I'll explain what I mean, we either have to end the sore loser rule that prevents the loser of a party primary from getting her or his name on the ballot in the general elections, or my preference, end party primaries altogether, as we did in California when we adopted the top two system. I'm going to recommend a way uh, in this hour of eliminating uh, or changing top two to something that I think would be more exciting and appealing for California and more effective in reducing polarization. Obviously, I'd like to eliminate the Electoral College. It's not going to happen anytime soon, but I'll say a further word about it. Reform campaign finance, as Roe uh, indicated. I'd like to reform the way the Congress works. I have something very specific to say about reforming the Supreme Court. And I'll try and speak to some of these other matters of democratic norms, civic education and social media, but in the half hour probably I have left, uh, I can't get to all of this. So let's talk about the right to vote and free and fair elections. A key principle of a democracy is neutral electoral administration and a minimum of partisan interference in elections. This is gravely at risk now as a result of Trump trying to uh, intervene in the electoral process uh, in 2020 to undermine the neutrality and integrity of electoral administration. And you now have Trump Republicans running uh, in several states, uh, including uh, Georgia, uh, and I think Michigan, to be Secretary of State with the explicit purpose of partisanizing, if I can use that term, uh, electoral administration to ensure that they get the outcome they want. I personally feel, and have felt for a long time, and wrote uh, months ago in uh, an editorial uh, with a couple of experts, including the former Secretary of State of Connecticut, that the office of Secretary of State should not be an elective and certainly not partisan position. Why on earth, just think about it, would you want your elections to be overseen by someone who herself is running for office? I mean, it makes no sense. Or in, in, in Georgia in 2018, you had Brian Kemp running for uh, governor of Georgia while he was 
administering elections in the state of Georgia. I cannot imagine a more massive and unacceptable conflict of interest in a democracy. And indeed, I know of no other democracy in the world that uh, has elections structured in terms of administration in this way. So um, more generally, we have to deepen the professionalization and separation from partisan politics of electoral administration and seal it off from partisan pressure and influence and make it a professional role. Obviously, I uh, favor getting rid of gerrymandering and um, making this a nonpartisan exercise as well. I voted for the proposition that created an independent commission uh, in California to do this. But with the election uh, uh, for the House so finely uh, drawn now for 2022, and with Republicans uh, largely resisting doing this, I really don't favor any longer a state-by-state -state approach because it uh, amounts to unilateral disarmament. And when you have, I'm sorry to use this analogy, uh, you know, uh, a conflict going on and one side unilaterally disarms, it usually means their defeat. So um, I now believe we need a national solution for this. And of course, that would be a simple bill uh, like the Freedom to Vote Act that I'll speak about shortly that would um, require nonpartisan methods of uh, redrawing district boundaries. Uh, we need minimum national standards for voter registration and voting in federal elections. The Freedom to Vote Act which is the successor bill to um, the uh, original bills on voting rights that um, Amy Klobuchar, Joe Manchin, and others reached a compromise agreement on would be uh, a good approach here. And we need adequate funding for election administration. The Republicans, Mitch McConnell and his infinite wisdom uh, and others blocked uh, the effort of Democrats to try and get the one to two billion dollars uh, nationally in funding that state uh, and local election uh, administrators were seeking to help them modernize their equipment. And if we had not had private foundations step up and provide um, hundreds of millions of dollars in private philanthropic support to state and local official electoral administration of functions in 2020, I don't think the election outcome would have been as smooth or uh, neutral and fair uh, as it was. And we shouldn't be relying on private philanthropies to make up this funding gap. As you know, HR1 would expand voting rights, um, including automatic voter registration, would defend uh, voting rights, uh, particularly with the companion John Lewis um, uh, Voting Rights Advancement Act, would end uh, gerrymandering and ensure election security. No election should ever take place in the United States without a paper record of the vote that can be audited uh, and if necessary, recounted. And so any machine, and there still are some, that uh, leaves a, a paperless trail uh, uh, of the vote is not adequate and should be retired. Uh, HR1 would do other reforms, not all of which I think are uh, great. I, can speak to the campaign finance issue later uh, in terms of the matching system, but the transparency in campaign finance is extremely important. Some kind of matching system for small donors is necessary. And we definitely, definitely need to strengthen ethics and accountability rules. Uh, it's urgently important that we fully restore the 1965 Voting Rights Act including the provision 
uh, that requires certain states to get uh, advance permission from the Justice Department before changing their procedures uh, on voting. I'm a, same, a strong supporter of same day voter registration and automatic registration as in motor voter laws. And we should make it easier to vote. Why should anybody uh, in the United States, which already has a relatively low voter turnout rate compared to its other peer democracies, wanna make voting harder? Uh, voting should be a national holiday. There should be at least 15 days in advance to vote by mail for anyone who wants to do it. I think, and you will not find this in any of the current reform bills, that we should move uh, primary elections closer to the general election. One of the problems we have, I'm about to speak in much greater detail about this, is that candidates are nominated in low turnout party primary elections. And who's gonna turn out in a low turnout party primary election? It's the most faithful and vigorous within the two parties. And they tend to be, maybe not in the Silicon Valley, but uh, overall in the country, they tend to be uh, the most militant members of the party, the most ideologically extreme. And this is of course, particularly true in the Republican party, which is why people like uh, Jeff Flake uh, and um, Bob Corker and Rob Portman and Anthony Gonzalez uh, have been deciding uh, to not run for re-election in a Republican primary because the, the first filter, the first gateway to re-election is an unrepresentative sample of the electorate dominated by these highly motivated people. One way to uh, improve the democraticness of the uh, primary election process would be to move uh, elections closer to the general election. I would recommend after Labor Day when more people are paying attention. And I now favor um, making voting compulsory. You know, Australia has like uh, over 80% voter turnout rate. And I was recently on a panel with an Australian member of parliament. And it's often thought that the fact that they have ranked choice voting for their parliament might be the reason that they have a much higher voter turnout rate. And it is one reason elections are more open and inclusive. But another, a very important one, this member of parliament stressed is that voting is compulsory and you get fined if you don't vote. Uh, and it's a civic duty and people take it seriously and uh, the fine reinforces that. It's like a traffic ticket. So I favor doing that in our libertarian era. I'm not sure uh, we could achieve that, but I think we need to lay down some markers for the future that we may not achieve now, but could achieve in the future. We need to strengthen uh, election security, as I've said, um, uh, and this involves modernizing the voting machines uh, and the other reforms. I'm gonna skip this now that I've spoken of. The new Freedom to Vote Act, as I said, that is a compromise bill forged by Joe Manchin uh, and Amy Klobuchar and a number of other Democrats would make uh, election day, uh, the general election day, a national holiday, first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. It would uh, ensure, it would require same day voter registration in all states. It would um, create minimum federal standards for mail voting, would ban partisan gerrymandering, would introduce some kind of um, loose but required uh, identification uh, for voters. And I think that's a reasonable compromise Democrats can make. Uh, you know, you could even bring a utility bill or something. Um, but, uh, you know, that may be a way of getting more Republicans uh, on board. Uh, in the end, I, I think that this Republicans are going to make this a litmus test and uh, it will be very difficult to get even a few Republicans to sign on to this bill, not to mention uh, the 10 that are needed to clear uh, the filibuster. 
So I am hoping uh, and praying, frankly, uh, that Senator Manchin will agree to a very narrow cutout uh, for the gerrymandering uh, provision, uh, sorry, for the filibuster, which I think is all he would agree to is a narrow cutout. Um, uh, with one exception I'll speak about later, um, a narrow cutout that would lift the filibuster for issues related to the protection of democracy. Um, now I'd like to speak about reducing polarization and why ranked choice voting, I think, uh, is uh, a promising policy response to our crippling polarization. The fact is Congress has become far more ideologically and politically polarized than it has been at any time in a century. It's now a zero sum struggle for domination. Compromise is exceedingly difficult. Uh, and when it happens, I think we should embrace it. This is why I'll just say, uh, I think it is a, a staggering mistake on part of them, the Democrats to hold up the bipartisan uh, infrastructure bill uh, and hold it hostage to the larger uh, infrastructure bill that Democrats are seeking to pass and reconciliation. I can speak more to that in the question and answer period. Um, uh, we have had, I think, years now of congressional deadlock where very little gets done unless somehow the filibuster can be uh, surmounted. Usually it happens through reconciliation bills. The people have also become much more polarized, not quite as separated uh, into mutually uh, uh, exclusive camps as the Congress, but they're pretty far along. There's growing not only political and ideological separation and lack of overlap and lack of cooperation between the parties, but real enmity and, and uh, distrust. And I think I can use the word hatred so that if you ask people uh, how they'd feel about having their son or daughter marry someone of a different faith or marry someone of a different race or marry someone of a different political party, um, whatever their reservations about other forms of um, pluralism being brought into the family, the one that they most resist is political pluralism. Uh, and uh, this is um, this quite a, a growing uh, indication of dysfunction in our body politic, that people from different parties can't sit in the room with one another, can't talk to one another, don't interact with one another. We live in different worlds. Um, well, you know, most of us probably know someone or have a friend or two uh, who, or more who are Republicans, but a surprising number of Democrats in this country don't and Republicans vice versa with Democrats. This is not a healthy thing. Um, our voters are more intensely partisan and ideological than they've been in a century. Uh, and the more ideological voters vote disproportionately, as I said, in party primaries. The polarizing formula I have alluded to, it's uh, that we have a two-party dominant system. Candidates are nominated in the low turnout primary elections. If a moderate candidate loses to a more ideologically extreme candidate in a party primary, they have no path back to re-election or election uh, in the general election because of the sore loser rule. And the first past the post rule in general elections, whoever gets the most votes wins, means that uh, if there's an independent who wants to offer a more moderate leaning alternative, if for example, the two parties have leaned in mutually polarizing uh, 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 directions, that candidate usually loses almost always, not because uh, people are uh, irretrievably wedded to one or the other of the two parties, but because they fear wasting their vote on an independent or third alternative. It could be green, it could be libertarian. 
And so they peel away from that as the general election draws near and vote for, quote, the lesser of two evils. So uh, this is why I favor uh, ranked choice voting. Uh, you can do it in single member districts. You can do it in multi-member districts. To have uh, ranked choice voting or any kind of voting in multi-member districts for Congress, we would need federal legislation to lift the ban on multi-member districts in the US House. And I don't think that will come anytime soon, but you know, state by state, we could implement, and two states have implemented, Maine and Alaska, ranked choice voting for US members of the House and their state legislatures and so on. Uh, and so I would favor that to begin to change the system. My, my preferred approach is to take what we have in California, the nonpartisan blanket primary, uh, and make it, uh, wet it to ranked choice voting. So instead of having the top two candidates advance to the general election, uh, I would propose that we take the top four candidates and some people prefer the top five candidates and send them on to November and then use ranked choice voting to determine the winner. In a ranked choice voting election, uh, you count up, this is typically the way it works, though there are other ways I could describe. You count up the number of uh, votes, uh, first place votes for each candidate. How many uh, people uh, ranked first candidate A, candidate B, and so on. If nobody gets a majority of first preference votes, then as they've been doing in San Francisco, Oakland, uh, Minneapolis, other cities in the US, you eliminate the candidate with the lowest number of first preference votes. And then again, you keep doing this uh, until someone gets an absolute majority of the remaining votes. Uh, and uh, you can see here as a hypothetical example, it may not be the candidate who gets the initial highest number of first preference votes. Maybe that's a candidate who's a polarizing figure and can pick up a certain number of other votes, but there might be somebody else who's more broadly appealing. And broad appeal is what we want if we want to disable extremism and polarization in the United States. We should try and uh, enable the election of candidates who can appeal to the majority of the electorate, whether it's for governor, uh, uh, for other statewide office, um, or for Senate, House, state legislature, whatever. The logic of ranked choice voting is, first of all, to give motor voters more, more choice. And if you end the spoiler rule, you'll enable voters to really consider independents and third party candidates and uh, then rank first their preference in their heart and second, you know, their tactical preference if that first person doesn't make it. Uh, you encourage broad coalition formation as we've seen in some of these elections where candidates may join together and say, well, vote for me first, but if I don't make it, you know, uh, rank the, my friend, uh, not my enemy, uh, as, your, uh, as your second choice. And when you need second preference votes in order to win, you tend to get cleaner, less negative, less cynical uh, elections. And indeed we have some research to show uh, that municipal elections using ranked choice voting uh, have been less negative. If partisan primaries continue to be used, then you know my view now. I think we should eliminate the sore loser rule. And if a Rob Portman loses the Ohio primary, of course he's not running again, but let's say he were for reelection, um, he should be able to come back and contest in the general election and say, look, I'll, I'll see you in the general election uh, and we'll use ranked choice voting and you may find that I'll beat you uh, when I'm running with a broader electorate. 
And if we started getting some of these candidates winning through ranked choice voting uh, and defying uh, the uh, you know, Salem witch hunters in their party, they might be liberated to be more moderate, more creative, more uh, willing to compromise on different things. It would unleash them. So uh, these are um, my uh, proposals. Alaska adopted the top four primary system with ranked choice voting, and it will be used for the first time in 2022. There is a bill uh, in the Congress, it's called the Fair Representation Act, that would create multi-member districts of three to five members. I can talk about this in the Q&A, but it isn't going to pass anytime soon. Uh, you can see why this would make sense because uh, there's so much disproportionality in uh, the, the representation uh, in Congress, both from heavily Democratic states and heavily Republican states. Um, a part of this owes to um, the natural patterning where Republicans are more spread out in uh, uh, rural districts, Democrats are heavily concentrated in urban districts. So there's a lot of wasted Democratic votes because of their over-concentration geographically in a few districts. Uh, but part of it is because of cynical, relentless gerrymandering in states like uh, North Carolina uh, and so on. Uh, I've spoken about the Fair Representation Act. I'm gonna skip it now. Um, how do we get reform? Well, we get reform the way we got it in Alaska and Maine through a bottom-up process of mobilization. There are 24 states that have the voter initiative or some kind of referendum. And I think that's the most likely way we're going to win. It was a narrow win in Alaska in 2020. It was a loss that I think didn't need to happen for ranked choice voting in Massachusetts. Uh, but there was a victory for RCV in New York that you know about, and it's one in many cities. And other uh, electoral reforms like eliminating gerrymandering, automatic voter registration, and again, the adoption of RCV have, have happened in other states in recent years by the voters, by voter initiative. And this has happened recently in 2020 to eliminate gerrymandering in Virginia and to reform campaign finance in Oregon. I think with campaign finance, we definitely need transparency for all campaign donations. I would eliminate the loophole that provides tax deductibility for 501c4s that can spend 49% of their funds on campaigns. I think this is an outrageous loophole. We can exp experiment with vouchers, as Seattle has been doing, with matching contributions. And I would raise the individual limits on campaign contributions. Again, I can talk about why. But I'm almost out of time. So let me talk about the Supreme Court. Uh, this is such an outrage. Um, a lot of it is the random luck of the draw that has uh, created a situation where, as you can see here, we've had Republicans in office for 24 years, up through January 2020, Democrats in office for 20 years, but Republicans have nominated 11 of the 15 justices that have been nominated during this period. And I think that, uh, first of all, we should correct for potential unfair, completely random, historical anomalies in this way. And second of all, I felt for a long time that what's happening now is per perverse. Presidents are choosing younger and younger uh, Supreme Court nominees uh, to pursue the vanity of having their nominee on the court for several decades. Uh, and in addition, people are living longer and longer. So Amy Coney Barrett, could be on the court for the next 40 years. She could well wind up being the longest uh, serving justice in American history. And I just don't think it's democratic 
to have a Supreme Court justice on the court for that law. Therefore, I support some version of the bill which Ro Khanna has uh, co-sponsored that would create fixed terms of 18 years for the Supreme Court, after which they could continue on the federal bench. And in each four year presidential term, a president would be able to nominate a new justice in the first and third year of his or her presidential term. Everyone would know this would, was coming. It would avoid, uh, unless there was a sudden death, election year fights over a Supreme Court justice. It would uh, ensure against arbitrariness and unfairness. Finally, let me just say, we need to renew a civic commitment to our democracy. We need to do, do more to defend our democratic norms and to teach them in our schools uh, and, in all, and to affirm them in all of our associations. The highest obligation of a democratic system is not only to participate in the way you're doing, but to defend the democratic features of the system against any immediate political interest. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield the balance of my time. Um, I thought I would start with a question that, uh, simple question that Joanne raised. You know, 2016, 1820, they were all the election of our lifetime. And it looks like that trend's not gonna stop in 22 and 24. What should we each do about burnout? How do we stay energized? This democracy stuff seems hard. It is hard, um, but <laughs> I'm sorry to put it this way. Um, there is a sense, sense in which misery loves company. And um, so I think we should draw hope, inspiration, tenacity, and um, endurance from awareness uh, that many people around the world have it much more difficult than we do. Look at Alexei Navalny now uh, returning to Russia, knowing he was going to be uh, thrown into jail by Vladimir Putin, but feeling that he had to do it uh, uh, for the struggle for democracy. Look at some of my friends uh, who were in the parliament in Burma or in the civil society in Burma and are now in hiding or in exile because of the military coup. Look at the brave people of Venezuela, the ones who haven't uh, gone into exile, who are trying to resist this horrible dictatorship. You know, freedom, uh, it's such a truism. I'm sorry if I sound trite, but freedom isn't free. And um, uh, we've come to take it for granted because we've had a secure and liberal democracy um, for virtually all of our lives. Uh, and um, so whether we were active in politics or not, whether we protested the Vietnam War or not, whether we campaigned and protested for civil rights or not, whether in more recent years we've joined the civil rights struggle again, some people on this uh, Zoom may have gone down to Georgia, you know, to help in that effort. Whatever it might be, um, you know, we've had it easy compared to some of our predecessors in the United States and compared to many people around the world. So I'd say step one is perspective, that um, we are blessed with this amazing free society and, you know, a republic, Benjamin Franklin said, if you can keep it. And we've now entered a, an era that's more difficult and where if we are not active and we are not vigilant and we are not engaged, we will not keep it. Uh, secondly, I think we just need to kind of take a deep breath and say to ourselves, um, it, it's a mentality I think we need to acquire. It's, it's I've acquired it. Um, it's not easy. Uh, I don't uh, uh, pretend uh, to have achieved equanimity or anything close to, uh, you know, mental ease in this regard. 
but it's a mindset that says, this is going to be probably a 10 year battle. Um, we're not talking about one election or another. And, you know, we've done it. We elected Biden. Now we can relax again and go back to our lives. Um, because first of all, there is a very serious chance that Biden will be defeated in 2024. There's a pretty decent chance that Trump will be the person that defeats him. There's a better than even chance that the Democrats will lose both houses of Congress. And there's a very good chance that even if none of that happens, we're still gonna be facing, for all the other reasons uh, that we've been talking about, existential challenges to democracy over the course of this decade. So let's just accept that. Let's um, uh, resolve that, you know, I, my appeal to my friends on this call would be develop this mindset that, you know, we're going we're gonna to be called upon uh, every other year to really spend some effort and time when we can. We're probably going to need to, well, I would put it this way, tax ourselves. Uh, you know, Democrats say, well, we should pay higher taxes to improve the collectivity. Um, I want to pay higher taxes, okay, from my own uh, salary, because I think we need it to advance the civic good. Let's just resolve. We'll take some of the money we would have paid happily uh, to improve our collectivity uh, and higher taxes and donate it uh, for candidates who will defend our democracy and fight for uh, a, a better common purpose. And so it's a mentality. And along the way, you know, take joy from your friends, joy from your family, uh, play hard and work hard. That would be my philosophy. Okay, well, thank you. I know a number of the questions we have were about, you know, what do you think about the filibuster, the Electoral College, the Supreme Court? And you have tackled that in your talk. Where do we start? What are actions that people could take? And I think you talked about some of them. I, I felt there was a sort of an act local. What's happening in local groups? What's happening in states? Can you talk about, you know, what are the incremental steps that we should take to get somewhere? to get through the items that you identified. Right, let me just say with the filibuster, I, I didn't say everything I have to say. I would favor eliminating it, even though it's very risky. I don't think we can achieve that right now. So I would favor urging uh, Mansion and Cinema to support a narrow cutout for voting rights. And I think it is possible, actually, that we can get Mansion and Cinema to agree to a, um, a talking filibuster. Uh, that is to go back to the old rule that you have to hold the Senate floor in order to filibuster, and that would reduce the use of it. Uh, so I, I favor that, and I think we should zero in on that. On the act locally, um, I think we should pursue creative reforms uh, at the local level where we can. I think every city, and where there are a lot of other Democrat controlled cities uh, in the United States and California, Los Angeles uh, and others, uh, and still many uh, in the South Bay, I'm not sure, but I don't think San Jose has ranked choice voting. Someone could correct me if I'm wrong about that. I'd say let's just push ranked choice voting everywhere we can uh, and get the American people uh, you know, to feel comfortable with it and normalized with it. I don't wanna make it a democratic party reform. I wanna make it an American reform to provide more choice and more competition and less polarization uh, in our elections. And just like Seattle uh, instituted campaign vouchers uh, for its own municipal elections. I think other municipalities uh, could do that uh, as well. Um, I'd say uh, reach out to your members of Congress and urge them to try, now obviously you would be reaching out to Democratic members of Congress from the Bay Area, urge them to try to appeal whenever they can and align or um, 
work across uh, party lines whenever they can. You know, Ro Khanna has just uh, co-sponsored with um, Mike Gallagher, a Republican from Wisconsin, and a couple of others, uh, a bipartisan act uh, to invest in high technology, the Endless Frontiers Act. And so when our members of Congress do co-sponsor across party lines, write them and thank them for that and encourage their better instincts. A little more than on ranked choice voting. A couple of people in the live question, uh, Arthur Kanita, talked about, well, what about approval voting? Isn't that easier? I don't want to get into a technical discussion of all the methods, but uh, you, you, you've been stating that ranked choice voting really is the best approach. I think we should experiment with lots of different options. Mm -hmm. Approval voting uh, is another, I'd say, very serious alternative. With approval voting, uh, just so everybody knows, uh, it's a simple method that has been used on occasion in some elections. I think it may have been adopted now for St. Louis municipal elections where you just put a tick by any candidate you can live with. You know, you say, I approve, and those are the only people I approve, and whoever gets the most um, approval votes would win. And what I would like to see at the municipal level and maybe at the state level is a certain amount of experimentation. And let's see how all these different systems work, which people like most, which is most effective at... um, generating uh, inclusion and which is more most effective at, um, uh, uh, at marginalizing extremism, containing expre- extremism. The reason why um, I don't personally like approval voting as much is that I have preferences. And, um, you know, I think democracy is in part about uh, uh, preferences. And in approval voting, you can't indicate your preferences. And my fear is that if people have a strong preference, they might not tick more than one approval candidate, particularly when it gets to higher consequence uh, elections, because they fear that they're just equally weighting a candidate or a party they have a strong approval for and a candidate or party they have a weak approval for. But, you know, I'm open-minded. I want to see what works. Uh, And this is not my preferred method, but I'd like to test it and see, uh, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom. The one thing I am convinced of, Lawrence, as a political scientist, is that the current method of election we use of first past the post in low turnout party primaries is the worst possible system we could have uh, if our concern is political polarization. Okay, I think that answers the question for people, uh, which is let's, let, let's try more. Social media, the news, you know, all the sort of truth and lies, you know, many people, Lynn, Carol, Jerry, Ron, in our question sort of asked about how do we create a better information environment? And how should we react to, you know, what somebody called the lies upon lies and misinformation that now seem to dominate our information space, which is clearly having a lot of influence on on how things happen. Um, I think that uh, there are things we could do uh, with regard to candidates and campaigns to get them to, sign pledges. I think it would be voluntary, but candidates who didn't sign them should really be stigmatized to reject deceptive digital campaign practices like the ones I've noted in this slide. Platforms um, uh, could reinforce this by rejecting political ads from campaigns that don't sign this pledge. Now, for a time, Facebook decided to reject all political campaign ads. Uh, I'm not sure that's exactly the answer either. Um, But I think the platform should purge ads that violate the pledge and and they should flag and remove disinformation much more aggressively than they've been doing. Though I think they've been somewhat trying. 
They should develop early warning systems uh, for electoral disinformation, particularly from foreign actors. And um, I think we need more transparency from the social uh, media platforms with regard to how ads are being used. And I would um, require uh, a 48 hour period before election uh, that um, basically takes digital political ads off the air, whether this would be constitutional, I think is questionable. I think, uh, you know, a big problem is this computer generated disinformation and trashing mechanism, the bots, and the platforms do have technology to identify those automated uh, trashing mechanisms and they should do so or even remove them. And we need more um, uh, 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 research on this. I might add, I don't wanna make this another lecture, um, that we need to encourage people to act with restraint uh, and to model good behavior on social media. And uh, this is why I've started using Twitter much more uh, sparingly. And you know, I really, um, in many ways, have great admiration for Steve Schmidt. Um, I think who managed McCain's 2008 presidential campaign and is um, one of the founders of the Lincoln Project and a brilliant, brilliant guy. And I think someone along with some of these other uh, Republicans who worked for George Bush and John McCain and Mitt Romney and can't stomach Donald Trump who've proven to be great patriots. But if you read Steve Schmidt's Twitter feed, it's really out there in the politics of personal uh, venomous destruction of um, his political enemies on the pro-Trump side. And I, I do think these people should be denounced for their hostility to democracy. But when you do it with the kind of venomous personal tone that he uses, I think you're contributing to the problem. So let's be careful and responsible in our choice of words. So on that topic, uh, you know, Jill asked about how do we begin the process of talking and listening to people have a different point of view? And I have an additional variant of that, which is, you know, we as volunteers are going to be talking to lots of voters across the country and canvassing, you know, how even in our short moments of contact, can we be you know, listening more. You talk, I know, about delib democratic deliberation. Yeah, I haven't really gotten to my, <laughs> my slides on democratic deliberation. But let me say first um, that I think you've answered your own question and I don't mind your having done so. We need to do a lot more listening. If you go to the Central Can Valley in um, the summer or fall of 2022 to uh, campaign for Josh Harder or TJ Cox, or you go to a swing district or state somewhere else to campaign for a Democratic candidate. You know, it might not hurt to say, um, uh, you know, I'm here, uh, I'm campaigning for uh, X or Y, but uh, I wonder if I could have a couple minutes of your time. Um, you know, I'd like to know what, what issues are you concerned about? Um, how, how do you see things? And look for an opening. Uh, maybe they'll say, um, oh, you know, the Democrats, they don't care about me. Uh, I haven't been able to uh, get a job. And, you know, all these foreigners are coming in and taking my jobs. And um, if you can acknowledge their pain, their insecurity, their anxiety. Obviously you can't do that if what emerges is a uh, tirade of uh, racial bigotry. But um, short of that, if you can try and listen, find some common ground, show that you care, you know, we're all Americans. Uh, how can we get out of this together? And, um, try and navigate around their disbeliefs um, 
you know, uh, and see where you might find an opening. With some number of people, you're going to find um, an opening where um, uh, they're going to have a need, a concern, where they, you know, they might have a belief about the Democratic Party or Democratic, the Democratic candidate in the district uh, that you're working in that is untrue. So you've got to be armed with information that you can show them to rebut their bad information uh, and try and find some common ground. Um, I would say second, um, be astute, tactical and sensible in your use of time. There are a certain number of people <laughs> It's just not going to persuade, right? Um, uh, if they start with the fuselage of bigotry, and um, you can see the walls uh, coming down in terms of any willingness to engage uh, in reason or facts, and if what you get is um, you know, basically uh, a lot of the precepts of QAnon coming back at you, you're not going to persuade that person in five or 10 minutes. It might be, and I've heard stories about this, that after patient engagement over months uh, and trying gently to point out facts, that a family member uh, can pull such a person away from the abyss. Uh, from the cult-like devotion to this disinformation, but you're not going to do it in a 10-minute conversation on their doorstep. Um, all you might be able to do in that case is lower the temperature by showing them that someone, a Democrat from their district, from outside their district, um, show, came to their front door and showed that they cared and said something like, look, I respect your point of view. Um, I, I don't agree, but I just want you to know that people on the other side care about you as a person. You know, we wish you well. And, um, you know, hopefully we can work to get, find common ground to make our country a, a stronger country and a better democracy. And you never know, you, you may not get that person's vote, probably won't in November, but that might be one data point that accumulates with a lot of other data points that eventually tips them in a better direction. Um, I think some of our live audience, Karen and others, were a little struck by your statement that there was a possibility that we would see Trump winning in 2024. So uh, they're, they're sort of shocked that that's an idea that one could even imagine. So can you put a little bit of color on? Oh, yeah what the dynamics are that suggest that that's even a possibility? Well, um, yes. Uh, I think right now, if you talk to political experts, um, including leading political journalists and other analysts of American politics, uh, they think A, Donald Trump is going to run for the Republican nomination again, and B, uh, he's the leading candidate to get the Republican nomination. Now, neither of those that he's going to run and that if he runs, he's going to win should be taken for granted. Um, but I think that he now controls the Republican Party. And the fact that all these moderates are losing or withdrawing from primary competitions uh, is a signal that the Trump puritanical MAGA wing dominates the primaries and therefore dominates the party. And, um, you know, if the Anthony Gonzaleses don't think that they can win, or the Rob Portmans, uh, a district or state Republican primary, why should anybody think that anyone other than Trump can win the Republican uh, presidential primary in Ohio in 2024. Now, plenty could happen. The Republicans could fail to take the Senate. They could fail to take the House. 
They might begin to get the message that they're playing a losing hand with Trump. But I think this is my personal fear that it's going to take several years for the toxin to work through the Republican Party, maybe a number of years. So I think we don't know, but that the likelihood is that Trump will be the Republican nominee in 2024, the likelihood at this point. If it's Trump versus Biden, that is, if Biden does run for re-election, which he's saying he's uh, going to do, well, you know, you tell me what the state of the economy is going to be. You tell me what the state of the pandemic is going to be. You tell me whether al-Qaeda is going to reconstitute in Afghanistan, which I think it's already starting to do. And if it then succeeds in launching a terrorist attack on the United States before no early November of 2024, and I can give you a better sense of whether Joe Biden will be reelected. But consider this, uh, after uh, presiding over uh, the most calamitous and corrupt presidency in my lifetime, in which um, several hundred thousand people died because of his mismanagement of the pandemic, with the pandemic raging in the fall of 2024, of 2020, and with all the other, you know, assaults on institutions, assaults on truth, you know, flagrant disregard for our institutions, and just utter incompetence in his rule and chaotic coming and going of cabinet members and so on. With all of that, Trump got within about 60,000 votes of being reelected president. Because it, you know all it would have taken for him to win the presidential election, truly win it in 2020, would be to change you know, about 6,000, 7,000 votes, swing them from one direction to the other in Arizona, and a similar number in Georgia, and a, you know, a larger number in Pennsylvania. If you take any of, if you take the five states um, that were closest, uh, that put uh, Biden over the top, if any three of those five states, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Arizona, if any three of those five had gone, uh, to Trump instead of Biden, Trump would have been reelected. And it would have only taken 50, 60, the margin was only about 55, 60,000 votes in three of those, in the closest three of those states. So, um, you know, how difficult would it be for Trump to swing 60,000 votes in those three states? And then you add on to that the prospect that um, you're going to have electoral subversion in Arizona or in Georgia to ensure uh, that Trump wins by any means necessary. Uh, and um, you know, you gotta pray that the Democratic governors get elected in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, or you might have electoral subversion of the process there as well. So um, we're up against enormous odds. And at this point, uh, I would rate the chance of Biden, of, of the Democrats winning the 2024 presidential election at no better than 50-50. Not sure I should have asked that question, Larry. <laughs> um, so uh, a challenging situation, I think, puts even more emphasis on the importance of 2022 for all of us. So, so to move away from that future and look back at democratic institutions, um, we've talked a lot about government institutions and, and, and government processes. What role do other players in our, in our lives and economy have? What role do corporations and businesses have? What role does the labor movement, which has obviously been under much pressure, have? How do you see the other players in our society needing to contribute to, to retaining our democracy? Hugely important. Just hugely important. The unions are important mainly for their ability, 
much less perfect uh, than a generation or two ago to mobilize their members. Business is important for its ability to quietly, well, to forthrightly draw uh, limits around the potential for undemocratic behavior, but also to privately indicate to elected pro, uh, Republicans um, red lines that they can't abide and won't support. Um, I will say uh, from a little bit of um, uh, inside knowledge that the efforts to persuade business actors in some key states to quietly communicate to Republican state legislators in the fall of 2020 that they would not abide efforts by the Republican state legislature to steal the election, to steal the electoral college uh, one way or the other. This was before the election uh, and probably after as well, but obviously before we didn't know, so it was more meaningful. They would not abide efforts to steal uh, the electoral college vote. Um, I think we're very important in preempting potentially extremely damaging state legislative action to overturn Biden's victory in some key states. I cannot stress enough how important it is for American businesses to simply and forthrightly indicate publicly and even more pointedly privately to state legislatures, state elected officials, and even members of Congress that whatever their programmatic, ideological policy views on taxes, regulation, whatever it may be, um, they um, stand unalterably behind the defense of democratic practices and institutions, not only as a matter of principle, but that as a simple business calculation, that the destruction of American democracy or the interruption of American democracy would be extremely bad for business, and it would be. Okay, um, we're out of time. I want to come to my final question. And I want to thank everybody who submitted questions, apologize that we didn't get to all of them. For a final question, I think we've looked at a lot of challenges, Larry. You've also outlined steps, you know, 12 steps that uh, need to be taken, starting at the top. You talked to about us about, you know, incremental steps and starting locally. What gives you hope as you look forward? What, what, what is your hope and encouragement that you would give us? Well, um, what gives me hope is what I see happening at the grassroots level. Um, I mean, my God, look at what Stacey Abrams did in Georgia to mobilize voters and um, uh, get as close as she did in the 2018 gubernatorial election uh, and then do it successfully enough to get two, not one, two Democrats elected to the US Senate in December of 2020. But I also see, uh, uh, Lawrence, uh, a tremendous ferment building at the grassroots, and not just from Democrats, from Republicans uh, who care about democracy, and from the growing number, number of people who don't identify with either political party or any political party or Maybe they lean green or libertarian or whatever. Um, these people are pouring into campaigns uh, for democratic reform and innovation and renewal. Uh, and this is very, very uh, exciting and, and hopeful. And it means that um, we've got a real chance to reform our democratic institutions first, not only, but first, in states that have voter initiatives and referenda. And I think we really need to work to, um, to get those uh, 
those voter initiatives uh, on the ballot and then to, uh, to get them uh, adopted. Uh, I wanna say as well um, that uh, I've been involved now in a process of deliberative polling called America in One Room. In 2019, we brought together a random sample of 523 Americans uh, to Dallas, Texas to deliberate on many of the issues that divide, divide us like healthcare, the economy and immigration. And uh, we had the full spectrum, it was a random sample. And when you got people into a room to talk to one another and engage one another as fellow Americans and fellow human beings, all dealing with the challenges we deal with of work and home and community and family and kids and so on and so forth and fears for uh, our family and collective future. They did find a lot of common ground and they forged a lot of friendships across partisan lines. Uh, it was a beautiful and amazing experience. And now we're doing that again right now uh, online we have a deliberative poll, America in One Room, on climate and energy uh, that's taking place in two phases where we have over, um, ultimately, I think it will be more than a thousand randomly selected Americans who will be uh, deliberating with one another in small groups, as well as plenary sessions. And you know, Lawrence, when people get together and just talk about the problems that face us under what my colleague Jim Fishkin calls the head of the Center on Deliberative Democracy, good conditions. Nobody can dominate. Everybody has to respect and listen to one another. They actually find they like each other and they like engaging and talking. And so if we could enlarge that, and uh, I think we can enlarge that, uh, and scale that up in our communities and just get to talking again to one another without a D and an R on our forehead, I'm very hopeful. And I'm just gonna show one last slide that gives me hope. Um, people ask, what can I do? I know that's another question you must have gotten because I always, um, uh, I always get it. And um, so there are, one of the things that give me hope is that there's so many organizations now, many of them grassroots organizations like Represent Us, Unite America, Fair Vote, Issue One, of course, Common Cause, Kid Ad, the League of Women Voters, uh, the Brennan Center for Justice, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, and many others that are fighting uh, the battle against voter suppression, fighting not only to preserve uh, our democracy, but to um, reform it and improve it and innovate and get, get some of these, um, uh, these uh, voter initiatives passed. So I would encourage people to get involved in some of these other efforts and organizations as well. I will happily share my slides with you and that slide will be in there with the links uh, to the websites of the organizations. And, um, you know, let's keep talking. So we are the ones that we have been waiting for, it turns out. Thank you so much, Larry, for spending your time with us this afternoon. Thanks from all of the DVC members across the country who've become part of our action community as we went virtual. I think, as you said to me yesterday, 2022 is going to have to be a year where we get out and go visit people. We go to Central Valley here in California. We go to other states. We get back to canvassing. And we have these conversations that you're saying we so desperately need to have. And thank you also on behalf of the country. So thank you for your time.